Sir David Frederick Attenborough, born the 8th of May 1926, is an English broadcaster and natural historian. He is best known for writing and presenting in conjunction with the BBC Natural History Unit, the nine natural history documentary series forming the life collection that together constitute a comprehensive survey of animal and plant life on Earth. He is a former senior manager at the BBC, having served as controller of BBC Two and director of programming for BBC Television in the 1960s and 1970s. He is the only person to have won BAFTAs for programs in each of black and white, color, HD, 3D and 4K. In 2018 and 2019, he received the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Narrator. Attenborough is widely considered a national treasure in the UK, although he himself does not like the term. In 2002 he was named among the 100 Greatest Britons following a UK-wide poll for the BBC. He is the younger brother of the director, producer and actor Richard Attenborough, and older brother of the motor executive John Attenborough. <laughs> Early life and family Attenborough was born in Isleworth, Middlesex now part of West London, and grew up in College House on the campus of the University College, Leicester, where his father, Frederick, was principal. He is the middle of three long-lived sons, his elder brother, Richard, became an actor and director who died in 2014, and his younger brother, John, was an executive at Italian car manufacturer Alfa Romeo who died in 2012. During the Second World War, through a British volunteer network known as the Refugee Children's Movement, his parents also fostered two Jewish refugee girls from Europe. Attenborough spent his childhood collecting fossils, stones, and natural specimens. He received encouragement aged seven, when a young Jacketta Hawks admired his museum. He also spent much time in the grounds of the university, and, aged 11, he heard that the zoology department needed a large supply of newts, which he offered through his father to supply for 3D each. The source, which he did not reveal at the time, was a pond less than 5 meters from the department. A few years later, one of his adoptive sisters gave him a piece of amber containing prehistoric creatures. Some 50 years later, it would be the focus of his program The Amber Time Machine. In 1936, Attenborough and his brother Richard attended a lecture by Grey Owl Archibald Bellany at De Montfort Hall, Leicester, and were influenced by his advocacy of conservation. According to Richard, David was "...bowled over by the man's determination to save the beaver, by his profound knowledge of the flora and fauna of the Canadian wilderness and by his warnings of ecological disaster should the delicate balance between them be destroyed." The idea that mankind was endangering nature by recklessly despoiling and plundering its riches was unheard of at the time, but it is one that has remained part of Dave's own credo to this day. In 1999, Richard directed a biopic of Bellany entitled Grey Owl. Attenborough was educated at Wigiston Grammar School for Boys in Leicester and then won a scholarship to Clare College, Cambridge in 1945, where he studied geology and zoology and obtained a degree in natural sciences. In 1947, he was called up for national service in the Royal Navy and spent two years stationed in North Wales and the Firth of Forth. In 1950, Attenborough married Jane Elizabeth Ebsworth Oriel. She died in 1997. The couple had two children, Robert and Susan. Robert is a senior lecturer in bioanthropology for the School of Archaeology and Anthropology at the Australian National University in Canberra. Susan is a former primary school headmistress. Topic: First years at the BBC. After leaving the Navy, Attenborough took a position editing children's science textbooks for a publishing company. He soon became disillusioned with the work, and in 1950 applied for a job as a radio talk producer with the BBC. Although he was rejected for this job, his CV later attracted the interest of Mary Adams, head of the Talks Factual Broadcasting Department of the BBC's fledgling television service. Attenborough, like most Britons at that time, did not own a television, and he had seen only one programme in his life. However, he accepted Adams' offer of a three-month training course, and in 1952 he joined the BBC full-time. Initially discouraged from appearing on camera because Adams thought his teeth were too big, he became a producer for the Talks Department, which handled all non-fiction broadcasts. 
His early projects included the quiz show Animal, Vegetable, Mineral, and Song Hunter, a series about folk music presented by Alan Lomax. Attenborough's association with natural history programs began when he produced and presented the three part series Animal Patterns. The studio bound program featured animals from London Zoo, with the naturalist Julian Huxley discussing their use of camouflage, aposematism, and courtship displays. Through this program, Attenborough met Jack Lester, the curator of the zoo's reptile house, and they decided to make a series about an animal collecting expedition. The result was Zoo Quest, first broadcast in 1954, where Attenborough became the presenter at short notice due to Lester being taken ill. In 1957, the BBC Natural History Unit was formally established in Bristol. Attenborough was asked to join it, but declined, not wishing to move from London where he and his young family were settled. Instead, he formed his own department, the Travel and Exploration Unit, which allowed him to continue to front Zoo Quest as well as produce other documentaries, notably the Traveler's Tales and Adventure series. In the early 1960s, Attenborough resigned from the permanent staff of the BBC to study for a postgraduate degree in social anthropology at the London School of Economics, interweaving his study with further filming. However, he accepted an invitation to return to the BBC as controller of BBC Two before he could finish the degree. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> BBC administration. Attenborough became the controller of BBC Two in March 1965, but had a clause inserted in his contract that would allow him to continue making programmes on an occasional basis. Later the same year he filmed Elephants in Tanzania, and in 1969 he made a three-part series on the cultural history of the Indonesian island of Bali. For the 1971 film A Blank on the Map, he joined the first Western expedition to a remote highland valley in New Guinea to seek out a lost tribe. BBC Two had been launched in 1964, but had struggled to capture the public's imagination. When Attenborough arrived as controller, he quickly abolished the channel's quirky kangaroo mascot and shook up the schedule. With a mission to make BBC Two's output diverse and different from that offered by other networks, he began to establish a portfolio of programmes that defined the channel's identity for decades to come. Under his tenure, music, the arts, entertainment, archaeology, experimental comedy, travel, drama, sport, business, science and natural history all found a place in the weekly schedules. Often, an eclectic mix was offered within a single evening's viewing. Programs he commissioned included Man Alive, Call My Bluff, Chronicle, Match of the Day, The Old Grey Whistle Test, Monty Python's Flying Circus and The Money Program. One of his most significant decisions was to order a 13-part series on the history of Western art, to show off the quality of the new UHF color television service that BBC Two offered. Broadcast to universal acclaim in 1969, Civilization set the blueprint for landmark authored documentaries, which were informally known as Tombstone or Sledgehammer projects. Others followed, including Jacob Bronowski's The Ascent of Man, also commissioned by Attenborough, and Alistair Cook's America. Attenborough thought that the story of evolution would be a natural subject for such a series. He shared his idea with Chris Parsons, a producer at the Natural History Unit, who came up with the title Life on Earth and returned to Bristol to start planning the series. Attenborough harbored a strong desire to present the series himself, but this would not be possible so long as he remained in a management post. While in charge of BBC Two, Attenborough turned down Terry Wogan's job application to be a presenter on the channel, stating that there weren't any suitable vacancies. The channel already had an Irish announcer, with Attenborough reflecting in 2016, "...to have had two Irishmen presenting on BBC Two would have looked ridiculous. This is no comment whatsoever on Terry Wogan's talents." Attenborough has also acknowledged that he sanctioned the wiping of programmes during this period to cut costs, including sketches by Alan Bennett, which he later regretted. In 1969, Attenborough was promoted to director of programmes, making him responsible for the output of both BBC channels. His tasks, which included agreeing budgets, attending board meetings, and firing staff, were now far removed from the business of filming programmes. When Attenborough's name was being suggested as a candidate for the position of Director General of the BBC in 1972, he phoned his brother Richard to confess that he had no appetite for the job. 
Early the following year, he left his post to return to full-time program making, leaving him free to write and present the planned natural history epic. Topic: <laughs> Return to broadcasting. After his resignation, Attenborough became a freelance broadcaster and immediately started work on his next project, a pre-arranged trip to Indonesia with a crew from the Natural History Unit. It resulted in the 1973 series Eastwards with Attenborough, which was similar in tone to the earlier zoo quest but without the animal collecting element. After his return, he began to work on the scripts for Life on Earth. Due to the scale of his ambition, the BBC decided to partner with an American network to secure the necessary funding. While the negotiations were proceeding, he worked on a number of other television projects. He presented a series on tribal art, the Tribal Eye, 1975, and another on the Voyages of Discovery, the Explorers, 1975. He also presented a BBC children's series about cryptozoology entitled Fabulous Animals 1975, which featured mythical creatures such as the Griffin and Kraken. Eventually the BBC signed a co-production deal with Turner Broadcasting and Life on Earth moved into production in 1976. Topic. Life series Beginning with Life on Earth in 1979, Attenborough set about creating a body of work which became a benchmark of quality in wildlife film making and influenced a generation of documentary film makers. The series also established many of the hallmarks of the BBC's natural history output. By treating his subject seriously and researching the latest discoveries, Attenborough and his production team gained the trust of scientists, who responded by allowing him to feature their subjects in his programs. In Rwanda, for example, Attenborough and his crew were granted privileged access to film Diane Fossey's research group of mountain gorillas. Innovation was another factor in life on Earth's success. New filmmaking techniques were devised to get the shots Attenborough wanted, with a focus on events and animals that were hitherto unfilmed. Computerized airline schedules, which had only recently been introduced, enabled the series to be elaborately devised so that Attenborough visited several locations around the globe in each episode, sometimes even changing continents mid-sentence. Although appearing as the on-screen presenter, he consciously restricted his time on camera to give his subjects top billing. The success of Life on Earth prompted the BBC to consider a follow-up, and five years later, The Living Planet was screened. This time, Attenborough built his series around the theme of ecology, the adaptations of living things to their environment. It was another critical and commercial success, generating huge international sales for the BBC. In 1990, The Trials of Life completed the original Life trilogy, looking at animal behavior through the different stages of life. The series drew strong reactions from the viewing public for its sequences of killer whales hunting sea lions on a Patagonian beach and chimpanzees hunting and violently killing a colobus monkey. In the 1990s, Attenborough continued to use the Life title for a succession of authored documentaries. In 1993, he presented Life in the Freezer, the first television series to survey the natural history of Antarctica. Although past normal retirement age, he then embarked on a number of more specialized surveys of the natural world, beginning with plants. They proved a difficult subject for his producers, who had to deliver five hours of television featuring what are essentially immobile objects. The result, The Private Life of Plants 1995, showed plants as dynamic organisms by using time-lapse photography to speed up their growth. Prompted by an enthusiastic ornithologist at the BBC Natural History Unit, Attenborough then turned his attention to the animal kingdom and in particular, birds. As he was neither an obsessive twitcher nor a bird expert, he decided he was better qualified to make The Life of Birds 1998 on the theme of behavior. The documentary series won a Peabody Award the following year. The order of the remaining Life series was dictated by developments in camera technology. For The Life of Mammals 2002, low-light and infrared cameras were deployed to reveal the behavior of nocturnal mammals. The series contains a number of memorable two shots of Attenborough and his subjects, which included chimpanzees, a blue whale and a grizzly bear. 
Advances in macrophotography made it possible to capture natural behavior of very small creatures for the first time, and in 2005, life in the undergrowth introduced audiences to the world of invertebrates. At this point, Attenborough realized that he had spent 20 years unconsciously assembling a collection of programs on all the major groups of terrestrial animals and plants, only reptiles and amphibians were missing. When Life in Cold Blood was broadcast in 2008, he had the satisfaction of completing the set, brought together in a DVD encyclopedia called Life on Land. In an interview that year, Attenborough was asked to sum up his achievement, and responded, The evolutionary history is finished. The endeavor is complete. If you'd asked me 20 years ago whether we'd be attempting such a mammoth task, I'd have said, Don't be ridiculous. These programs tell a particular story and I'm sure others will come along and tell it much better than I did, but I do hope that if people watch it in 50 years' time, it will still have something to say about the world we live in. However, in 2010 Attenborough asserted that his first life, dealing with evolutionary history before life on Earth, should also be included within the Life series. In the documentary Attenborough's Journey, he stated, This series, to a degree which I really didn't fully appreciate until I started working on it, really completes the set. Other documentaries Alongside the Life series, Attenborough has continued to work on other television documentaries, mainly in the natural history genre. He wrote and presented a series on man's influence on the natural history of the Mediterranean basin, the first Eden, in 1987. Two years later, he demonstrated his passion for fossils in Lost Worlds, Vanished Lives. Attenborough narrated every episode of Wildlife on One, a BBC One wildlife series that ran for 253 episodes between 1977 and 2005. At its peak, it drew a weekly audience of 8 to 10 million, and the 1987 episode, Meerkats United, was voted the best wildlife documentary of all time by BBC viewers. He has also narrated over 50 episodes of Natural World, BBC Two's flagship wildlife series. Its forerunner, The World About Us, was created by Attenborough in 1969, as a vehicle for colour television. In 1997, he narrated the BBC Wildlife Specials, each focusing on a charismatic species, and screened to mark the Natural History Unit's 40th anniversary. As a writer and narrator, he continued to collaborate with the BBC Natural History Unit in the new millennium. Alistair Fothergill, a senior producer with whom Attenborough had worked on the trials of life and life in the freezer, was making The Blue Planet 2001, the unit's first comprehensive series on marine life. He decided not to use an on-screen presenter due to difficulties in speaking to a camera through diving apparatus, but asked Attenborough to narrate the films. The same team reunited for Planet Earth 2006, the biggest nature documentary ever made for television and the first BBC wildlife series to be shot in high definition. In 2009, he co-wrote and narrated Life, a ten-part series focusing on extraordinary animal behavior, and narrated Nature's Great Events, which showed how seasonal changes trigger major natural spectacles. In 2011, Fothergill gave Attenborough a more prominent role in Frozen Planet, a major series on the natural history of the polar regions. Attenborough appeared on screen and authored the final episode, in addition to performing voiceover duties. Attenborough introduced and narrated the unit's first 4K production life story. For Planet Earth 2 2016, Attenborough returned as narrator and presenter, with the main theme music composed by Hans Zimmer. In October 2014, the corporation announced a trio of new one off Attenborough documentaries as part of a raft of new natural history programs Attenborough's Paradise Birds and Attenborough's Big Birds was shown on BBC Two and Waking Giants, which follows the discovery of giant dinosaur bones in South America, aired on BBC One. The BBC also commissioned Atlantic Productions to make a three-part, Attenborough-fronted series Great Barrier Reef in 2015. The series marked the tenth project for Attenborough and Atlantic, and saw him returning to a location he first filmed it in 1957. By the turn of the millennium, Attenborough's authored documentaries were adopting a more overtly environmentalist stance. 
In State of the Planet 2000, he used the latest scientific evidence and interviews with leading scientists and conservationists to assess the impact of man's activities on the natural world. He later turned to the issues of global warming, the truth about climate change, 2006, and human population growth, how many people can live on planet Earth, 2009. He also contributed a program which highlighted the plight of endangered species to the BBC's Saving Planet Earth project in 2007, the 50th anniversary of the Natural History Unit. Attenborough also forged a partnership with Sky, working on documentaries for the broadcaster's new 3D network, Sky 3D. Their first collaboration was Flying Monsters 3D, a film about pterosaurs which debuted on Christmas Day of 2010. A second film, The Bachelor King 3D, followed a year later. His next 3D project, Conquest of the Skies, made by the team behind the BAFTA-winning David Attenborough's Natural History Museum Alive, aired on Sky 3D at Christmas 2014. Attenborough has narrated three series of David Attenborough's Natural Curiosities for UK TV channel Watch, with the third series showing in 2015. He has also narrated a majestic celebration, Wild Karnataka, India's first blue-chip natural history film, directed by Kalyan Varma and Amokavasha. More recent projects On radio, Attenborough has continued as one of the presenters of BBC Radio 4's Tweet of the Day, which began a second series in September 2014. Blue Planet 2 was broadcast in 2017, with Attenborough returning as presenter. The series was critically acclaimed and gained the highest UK viewing figure for 2017, 14.1 million. Attenborough narrates the 2018 five part series Dynasties, each episode dealing with one species in particular. In 2019, Attenborough narrated Our Planet, an eight part documentary series, for Netflix. He will also narrate Wild Karnataka, a documentary about the Karnataka forest area. In March 2019, it was announced that Attenborough is to present an urgent one off film documentary about climate change for BBC One called Climate Change The Facts. Other work From 1983, Attenborough worked on two environmentally themed musicals with the WWF and writers Peter Rose and Anne Conlon. Yanomamo was the first, about the Amazon rainforest, and the second, Ocean World, premiered at the Royal Festival Hall in 1991. They were both narrated by Attenborough on their national tour and recorded onto audio cassette. Ocean World was also filmed for Channel 4 and later released. In 1990, he highlighted the case of Marjub Sharif as part of the BBC's Prisoners of Conscience series. In May 2005, Attenborough was appointed as patron of the UK's Blood Pressure Association, which provides information and support to people with hypertension. In January 2009, the BBC commissioned Attenborough to provide a series of 2010 minute monologues covering the history of nature. Entitled David Attenborough's Life Stories, they are broadcast on Radio 4 on Friday nights. Part of Radio 4's A Point of View strand, the talks are also available as podcasts. He appeared in the 2009 Children's Prom at the BBC Promenade Concerts and in the last night of the proms on 12 September 2009, playing a floor polisher in Sir Malcolm Arnold's A Grand, Grand Overture, after which he was shot by Rory Bremner, who was playing the gun. In 2009, he also became a patron of Population Matters formerly known as the Optimum Population Trust, a UK charity advocating sustainable human populations. He is also a patron of the Friends of Richmond Park and serves on the advisory board of BBC Wildlife magazine. Attenborough is also an honorary member of BSES Expeditions, a youth development charity that operates challenging scientific research expeditions to remote wilderness environments. Topic. Achievements, awards and recognition Attenborough's contribution to broadcasting and wildlife filmmaking has brought him international recognition. He has been called the great communicator, the peerless educator, and the greatest broadcaster of our time. 
His programs are often cited as an example of what public service broadcasting should be, even by critics of the BBC, and have influenced a generation of wildlife filmmakers. Styles and honours Mr. David Attenborough 1926 Mr. David Attenborough CBE 1974-1983 Mr. David Attenborough CBE FRS 1983-1985 Sir David Attenborough CBE FRS 1985-1991 Sir David Attenborough CVO CBE FRS 1991-1996 Sir David Attenborough CHCVO CBE FRS 1996-2005 Sir David Attenborough OM CHCVO CBE FRS 2005 to 2007 Sir David Attenborough OM CHCVO CBE FRS FSA 2007 Topic Honorary Titles By January 2013, Attenborough had collected 32 honorary degrees from British universities, more than any other person. In 1980, he was honoured by the Open University with whom he has had a close association throughout his career. He also has honorary Doctor of Science awards from the University of Cambridge 1984 and University of Oxford 1988. In 2006, the two eldest Attenborough brothers returned to their home city to receive the title of Distinguished Honorary Fellows of the University of Leicester, in recognition of a record of continuing distinguished service to the university. David Attenborough was previously awarded an Honorary Doctor of Letters degree by the university in 1970, and was made an Honorary Freeman of the City of Leicester in 1990. In 2013, he was made an Honorary Freeman of the City of Bristol. In 2010, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, his first in Africa. Attenborough has received the title Honorary Fellow from Clare College, Cambridge 1980, the Zoological Society of London 1998, the Linnean Society 1999, the Institute of Biology now the Royal Society of Biology 2000 and the Society of Antiquaries 2007. He is honorary patron of the North American Native Plant Society and was elected as a corresponding member of the Australian Academy of Science. Topic: Recognition. Attenborough has been featured as the subject of a number of BBC television programs. Life on Air 2002 examined the legacy of his work and Attenborough the Controller 2002 focused on his time in charge of BBC Two. He was also featured prominently in The Way We Went Wild 2004, a series about natural history television presenters, and 100 Years of Wildlife Films 2007, a special program marking the centenary of the nature documentary. In 2006, British television viewers were asked to vote for their favourite Attenborough moments for a UK TV poll to coincide with the broadcaster's 80th birthday. The winning clip showed Attenborough observing the mimicry skills of the superb lyrebird. Attenborough was named the most trusted celebrity in the UK in a 2006 Reader's Digest poll, and in 2007 he won the Culture Show's Living Icon Award. He has also been named among the 100 Greatest Britons in a 2002 BBC poll and is one of the top 10 heroes of our time. According to New Statesman magazine, in September 2009, London's Natural History Museum opened the Attenborough Studio, part of its Darwin Centre development. In December 2013, he was awarded the Freedom of the City of Bristol. In 2012, Attenborough was among the British cultural icons selected by artist Sir Peter Blake to appear in a new version of his most famous artwork, the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album cover, to celebrate the British cultural figures of his life. The same year, Attenborough featured in the BBC Radio 4 series The New Elizabethans to mark the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. A panel of seven academics, journalists and historians named him among the group of people in the UK, whose actions during the reign of Elizabeth II have had a significant impact on lives in these islands. In May 2016, it was announced that a new British polar research ship will be named RRS Sir David Attenborough in his honour. 
While an internet poll suggesting the name of the ship had the most votes for Boaty McBoatface, Science Minister Joe Johnson said there were more suitable names, and the official name was eventually picked up from one of the more favored choices. However, one of its research subs will be named Boaty in recognition of the public vote. Topic. Species named in Attenborough's honor At least 20 species and genera, both living and extinct, have been named in Attenborough's honor. Plants named after him include an alpine hawkweed discovered in the Brecon beacons, a species of Ecuadorian flowering tree Blakey Attenbury, one of the world's largest pitched carnivorous plants Nepenthes Attenbury, along with a genus of flowering plants Cerdavidia. Arthropods named after Attenborough include a butterfly, Attenborough's black-eyed satyr Eutychia Attenborough, a dragonfly, Attenborough's pintail Asozoma Attenborough, a millimeter-long goblin spider Prethopalpus Attenborough, an Indonesian flightless weevil Trigonopterus Attenborough, a Madagascan ghost shrimp C. Tenocholoides Attenborough, and a soil snail Polina Attenborough. The monogenian Cyclidogyrus attenbury, a parasite from a deep-sea fish in the Lake Tanganyika, is probably the only parasite species named after him. Vertebrates have also been named after Attenborough, including a Namibian lizard Platysaurus attenbury, a bird Polyoptila attenbury, a Peruvian frog Pristimantis attenbury, a Madagascan stump-toed frog Stumpfia david attenbury, and one of only four species of long-beaked echidna Zaglossus attenbury. In 1993, after discovering that the Mesozoic reptile Plesiosaurus conibiri did not belong to the genus Plesiosaurus, the paleontologist Robert Bakker renamed the species Attenborosaurus conibiri. A fossilized armored fish discovered in Western Australia in 2008 was named Matapishkus attenbury, after Attenborough had filmed at the site and highlighted its scientific importance in life on Earth. The Matapishkus fossil is believed to be the earliest organism capable of internal fertilization. A miniature marsupial lion, Microleo Attenbury, was named in his honor in 2016. The fossil grasshopper Electrotetix Attenbury was named after Attenborough. In March 2017, a 430 million year old tiny crustacean was named after him. Called Cascalus Revitus, the first word is a Latin translation of the root meaning of Attenborough, and the second is based on a description of him in Latin. In July 2017, the Caribbean bat Myotis Attenbury was named after him. A new species of fan-throated lizard from coastal Kerala in southern India was named Satana Attenbury in his honor when it was described in 2018. In 2018, a new species of phytoplankton, Cyrocosphira azuriplaneta, was named to honor the Blue Planet, the TV documentary presented by Attenborough, and to recognize his contribution to promoting understanding of the oceanic environment. The same year, Attenborough was also commemorated in the name of the scarab beetle Sylvie Canthan Attenbury. <laughs> <laughs> Awards 2017, Britain Australia Society Award for Outstanding Contribution to Strengthening British – Australian Bilateral Understanding and Relations 2017, Honorary Member of the Moscow Society of Naturalists 2017, Gold Medal of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society 2018, Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Narrator 2019, Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Narrator Topic. Lectures In 1973, he was invited to deliver the Royal Institution Christmas Lecture on the Language of Animals. Topic. Views and advocacy Topic. Environment Attenborough's programs have often included references to the impact of human society on the natural world. The last episode of The Living Planet, for example, focuses almost entirely on humans' destruction of the environment and ways that it could be stopped or reversed. Despite this, he has been criticized for not giving enough prominence to environmental messages. 
Some environmentalists feel that programs like Attenborough's give a false picture of idyllic wilderness and do not do enough to acknowledge that such areas are increasingly encroached upon by humans. Attenborough has subsequently become more vocal in his support of environmental causes. In 2005 and 2006, he backed a BirdLife International project to stop the killing of albatross by longline fishing boats. He gave public support to WWF's campaign to have 220,000 square kilometers of Borneo's rainforest designated a protected area. He also serves as a vice president of BTCV, vice president of Fauna and Flora International, president of Butterfly Conservation and president of Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. In 2003, he launched an appeal on behalf of the World Land Trust to create a rainforest reserve in Ecuador in memory of Christopher Parsons, the producer of Life on Earth and a personal friend, who had died the previous year. The same year, he helped to launch Archive, a global project instigated by Parsons to gather together natural history media into a digital library. Archive is an initiative of Wildscreen, of which Attenborough is a patron. He later became patron of the World Land Trust, and an active supporter. He supported Glinderborn in their successful application to obtain planning permission for a wind turbine in an area of outstanding natural beauty, and gave evidence at the planning inquiry arguing in favor of the proposal. Attenborough again took up the topic of population in an episode of Horizon entitled, How Many People Can Live on Planet Earth? He has written and spoken publicly about the fact that, despite past skepticism, he believes the Earth's climate is warming in a way that is cause for concern, and that this can likely be attributed to human activity. In a January 2013 interview with the Radio Times, Attenborough described humans as a plague on the Earth, and criticized the act of sending food to famine-stricken countries while overlooking population control. In May 2015, United States President Barack Obama interviewed Attenborough at the White House in Washington, D.C. Together, they discussed the future of the planet, their passion for nature and what measures can be taken to protect the environment. <laughs> Attitude to religion and creationism In a December 2005 interview with Simon Mayo on BBC Radio 5 Live, Attenborough stated that he considers himself an agnostic. When asked whether his observation of the natural world has given him faith in a creator, he generally responds with some version of this story, making reference to the Oncocerca volvulus parasitic worm. My response is that when creationists talk about God creating every individual species as a separate act, they always instance hummingbirds, or orchids, sunflowers and beautiful things. But I tend to think instead of a parasitic worm that is boring through the eye of a boy sitting on the bank of a river in West Africa, a worm, that's going to make him blind. And, I ask them, are you telling me that the God you believe in, who you also say is an all-merciful God, who cares for each one of us individually, are you saying that God created this worm that can live in no other way than in an innocent child's eyeball? Because that doesn't seem to me to coincide with a God who's full of mercy. He has explained that he feels the evidence all over the planet clearly shows evolution to be the best way to explain the diversity of life, and that as far as he's concerned, if there is a supreme being then he chose organic evolution as a way of bringing into existence the natural world." In a BBC4 interview with Mark Lawson, he was asked if he at any time had any religious faith. He replied simply, No. He has also said, It never really occurred to me to believe in God. In 2002, Attenborough joined an effort by leading clerics and scientists to oppose the inclusion of creationism in the curriculum of UK state-funded independent schools which receive private sponsorship, such as the Emanuel Schools Foundation. In 2009, he stated that the Book of Genesis, by saying that the world was there for people to dominate, had taught generations that they can dominate the environment, and that this has resulted in the devastation of vast areas of the environment. He further explained to the science journal Nature, "...that's why Darwinism, and the fact of evolution, is of great importance, because it is that attitude which has led to the devastation of so much, and we are in the situation that we are in." Also in early 2009, the BBC broadcast an Attenborough one-hour special, Charles Darwin and the Tree of Life. In reference to the programme, Attenborough stated that, "...people write to me that evolution is only a theory." Well, it is not a theory. 
Evolution is as solid a historical fact as you could conceive. Evidence from every quarter. What is a theory is whether natural selection is the mechanism and the only mechanism. That is a theory. But the historical reality that dinosaurs led to birds and mammals produced whales, that's not theory. He strongly opposes creationism and its offshoot, intelligent design, saying that a survey that found a quarter of science teachers in state schools believe that creationism should be taught alongside evolution in science lessons was really terrible. In March 2009, Attenborough appeared on Friday night with Jonathan Ross. Attenborough stated that he felt evolution did not rule out the existence of a god and accepted the title of agnostic saying, My view is, I don't know one way or the other but I don't think that evolution is against a belief in God. Attenborough has joined the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins and other top scientists in signing a campaign statement coordinated by the British Humanist Association BHA. The statement calls for creationism to be banned from the school science curriculum and for evolution to be taught more widely in schools. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> BBC and public service broadcasting. Attenborough is a lifelong supporter of the BBC, public service broadcasting and the television license. He has said that public service broadcasting is one of the things that distinguishes this country and makes me want to live here, and believes that it is not reducible to individual programs, but can only effectively operate as a network that measures its success not only by its audience size but by the range of its schedule. The BBC per minute in almost every category is as cheap as you can find anywhere in the world and produces the best quality. The BBC has gone through swinging staff cuts. It has been cut to the bone. If you divert license fee money elsewhere, you cut quality and services. There is a lot of people who want to see the BBC weakened. They talk of this terrible tax of the license fee. Yet it is the best bargain that is going. Four radio channels and God knows how many TV channels. It is piffling. Attenborough expressed the view there have always been politicians or business people who have wanted to cut the BBC back or stop it, adding there's always been trouble about the license and if you dropped your guard you could bet our bottom dollar there'd be plenty of people who'd want to take it away. The license fee is the basis on which the BBC is based and if you destroy it, broadcasting becomes a wasteland. He expressed regret at some of the changes made to the BBC in the 1990s by its director general, John Burt, who introduced an internal market at the corporation, slimmed and even closed some departments and outsourced much of the corporation's output to private production companies, in line with the Broadcasting Act 1990. In 2008, he criticized the BBC's television schedules, positing that the two senior networks, BBC One and BBC Two, which Attenborough states were first set up as a partnership, now schedule simultaneously programs of identical character, thereby contradicting the very reason that the BBC was given a second network. Topic: <laughs> Politics. In 2013, Attenborough joined rock guitarists Brian May and Slash in opposing the government's policy on the colour of badges in the UK by participating in a song dedicated to badges. In August 2014, Attenborough was one of 200 public figures who were signatories to a letter to The Guardian expressing their hope that Scotland would vote to remain part of the United Kingdom in September's referendum on that issue. Prior to the 2015 UK general election, Attenborough was one of several celebrities who endorsed the parliamentary candidacy of the Green Party's. Caroline Lucas, commenting on the 2016 U.S. presidential election in an interview by Radio Times, Attenborough jokingly commented on the rise of Donald Trump, do we have any control or influence over the American elections? Of course we don't. We could shoot him, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Health and future plans Attenborough had a pacemaker fitted in June 2013. In September 2013 he commented, If I was earning my money by hewing coal I would be very glad indeed to stop. But I'm not. I'm swanning round the world looking at the most fabulously interesting things. 
Such good fortune. Topic: Filmography. David Attenborough's television credits span seven decades, and his association with natural history programs dates back to the Pattern of Animals and Zoo Quest in the early 1950s. His most influential work, 1979's Life on Earth, launched a strand of nine authored documentaries with the BBC Natural History Unit, which shared the Life Strand name and spanned 30 years. He narrated every episode of the long-running BBC series Wildlife on One and in his later career has voiced several high-profile BBC wildlife documentaries, among them The Blue Planet and Planet Earth. He became a pioneer in the 3D documentary format with Flying Monsters in 2010. Topic. Books David Attenborough's work as an author has strong parallels with his broadcasting career. In the 1950s and 1960s, his published work included accounts of his animal collecting expeditions around the world, which became the Zoo Quest series. He wrote an accompanying volume to each of his nine life documentaries, along with books on tribal art and birds of paradise. His autobiography, Life on Air, was published in 2002, revised in 2009 and is one of a number of his works which is available as a self-narrated audiobook. Attenborough has also contributed forewords and introductions to many other works, notably those accompanying Planet Earth, Frozen Planet, Africa and other BBC series he has narrated. Bibliography. <inaudible> 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 Zoo Quest to Guyana 1956 Zoo Quest for a Dragon 1957 republished in 1959 to include an additional 85 pages titled Quest for the Paradise Birds Zoo Quest in Paraguay 1959 Quest in Paradise 1960 People of Paradise 1960 Zoo Quest to Madagascar 1961 Quest under Capricorn 1963 Fabulous Animals 1975 The Tribal Eye 1976 Life on Earth 1979 Discovering Life on Earth 1981 The Living Planet 1984 The First Eden The Mediterranean World and Man 1987 The Atlas of the Living World 1989 The Trials of Life 1990 the Private Life of Plants 1994 The Life of Birds 1998 The Life of Mammals 2002 Life on Air Memoirs of a Broadcaster 2002 Autobiography Revised in 2009 Life in the Undergrowth 2005 Amazing Rare Things The Art of Natural History in the Age of Discovery 2007 with Susan Owens Martin Clayton and Rhea Alexandratos Life in Cold Blood 2007 David Attenborough's Life Stories 2009 David Attenborough's New Life Stories 2011 Drawn from Paradise The Discovery Art and Natural History of the Birds of Paradise 2012 with Errol Fuller Adventures of a Young Naturalist The Zoo Quest Expeditions 2017 Journeys to the Other Side of the World Further Adventures of a Young Naturalist 2018 Dynasties: The Rise and Fall of Animal Families with Stephen Moss, BBC Books, 2018. ISBN 9781785943010. Topic: Audio recordings. Tarka the Otter by Henry Williamson, available on audio cassette, 1978. Yanomamo Musical Entertainment, 1983, by Peter Rose and Anne Conlon, on stage narration and published audio recording. Ocean World Musical Entertainment, 1990, by Peter Rose and Anne Conlon, on stage narration, including at the Royal Festival Hall, for audio recording and video broadcast, both published. Peter and the Wolf for BBC Music Magazine, free CD with the June 2000 issue. In addition, Attenborough has recorded some of his own works in audiobook form, including Life on Earth, Zoo Quest for a Dragon, and his autobiography Life on Air, Memoirs of a Broadcaster. <laughs> 